Dr. McGraw, would you uh, perhaps begin by telling us uh, how you first uh, came to know John Dewey? Well, the first connection started back in 1916 when I went to a little secondary school, a Methodist school in northern Alabama called Sneed Seminary. And um, at that time, an old judge sent me a magazine called The Independent, now defunct, and Edwin Slauson was running a series of articles in The Independent on the six major prophets. That included H.G. Wells and uh, Schiller, a whole bunch. And among them, an uh, article on uh, the teacher of teachers, John Dewey. So I sat down and wrote him a letter. And he wrote back. And from that time on until uh, he went to China, we carried on this correspondence. Um, I, as I said to you a little bit before, I once wrote to him said I felt he was like a godfather. So after that, the letters were always signed to GF and so forth. He, uh, that correspondence died down uh, when he went to China. I had one letter, uh, some cards from him on the way. I think Lucy went with him on the yes. trip to China. And I remember I had one letter enclosing a little pressed violet or something which he picked off the one of the city walls. And he had written that uh, the only disappointment of that trip was that he was moving so much and there was no more chance for correspondence. So with that, after that I graduated from this little school. I didn't know where I was going or what I was going to do, but I ended up in uh, at Ohio Wesleyan. And J.D. was still in, uh, in the Orient. I didn't hear. Well, by that time I began to learn from my professors what a great man I'd been in correspondence with, but was no, I didn't know myself, you see. So uh, I didn't, let, let's see, uh, I didn't hear that until the summer between my junior and senior year at Ohio Wesleyan. It was four years now, you see. So I came to uh, Philadelphia and um, I read in the paper that John Dewey had returned from the Orient. And I'd never told anybody about this correspondence, anyone. So uh, these people I was spending the summer with, who had helped me through college financially and so forth, were all were both graduates of Teachers College. Well, when I uh, read that he was uh, back in this country, I just wrote again and invited him to come to Philadelphia. <laughs> it's all very funny in a way. So uh, he wrote back he'd be glad to at some time when he could. So I decided I'd have to tell these people about it. I remember we sat out on the porch and I told them about this long correspondence that I'd carried and that he was, and they looked at me rather pathetically uh, and uh, said, listen, John Dewey is not the kind of person you and I invite, you know, we are. So, well, <coughs> no, I guess I said that before I wrote to them. That's what they said before. But I wrote him anyway and then got back this letter that uh, he would be, it was during a summer session at Columbia, that he would be glad to come down sometime and so forth. So uh, then I had to tell him later that he said he would come, and he wrote that he would come at a particular uh, weekend. Lo and behold, uh, the man, of course, they were very proud to have John Dewey in their home, etc. And I remember the man came from wherever he was. He traveled a great deal. He was a minister, came home just for the occasion. And of course, that came uh, a telegram that uh, he couldn't make it. So they looked at me again rather pathetically and said, well, 
you're going to be very disappointed. He's much too busy to come down here. Uh, you just go up there. <laughs> I don't know why we were so stupid, but we sent him a telegram then that I was coming to New York. I didn't know New York. I was ignorant as could be. I got off the... How old were you then? Well, by that time I was 20... 21, 22, 22, I guess. Between 21, mm -hmm. some of it was just before I graduated from, I mean, the year before, the summer before I entered my senior year mm -hmm. at Westland. So I, I got off the train at Pennsylvania Station and went looking up and down the uh, platform for this mustached man that the only thing I'd ever seen was in that picture of the Independent to be meeting me. This is more of a joke of my ignorance, story of my ignorance at that time. Well, I didn't find him. So how I found my way uh, to a little hotel called the Martha Washington for women, I don't know, but I landed there. And then I said to myself, well, I'm not going back until I see him. I just wasn't going to go back and tell these people I came up there and didn't see him at all. So I called his, at his home. I guess I got a maid. I don't know. Someone answered. And uh, he wasn't there. And I left the telephone number of the hotel. The next morning at 6 o'clock the telephone rang and I jumped out of my skin because there was nobody to call me but him. But it was the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got up and I said, well, I'm still not going back without seeing him. And to this day, I can't remember how I found my way to Columbia University. I know I landed over uh, in another building first and asked for uh, where his office was. And it was off the library in uh, Shermahorn, you remember. So I went in timidly into the librarian and I asked, could I see Dr. Dewey? And she said, well, there's his office there. I went over and it said office hours from 3 to 4. This was a little after 9 in the morning. <laughs> I'd gotten there early. And uh, so uh, I walked back to her. I said, his office hours is from 3 to 4. You think I could see him before then? She said, well, knock on his door. So I timidly knocked on the door, and this mild-mannered man answered, and I said, Dr. Dewey? Yes. I said, I know it isn't your office hour, but I wonder if I could see you. You know, because many summer students, I mean, I would be just like any other summer student. He said, come in. And I said, well, don't you know me? And he had just opened my telegram, which was sent to his office and was standing there thinking still, I guess, about this 16-year-old girl, you know, <laughs> uh, whom he was supposed to meet and hadn't. Well, we had a wonderful day. He took me down to a restaurant on uh, Columbus Circle, a Chinese restaurant, and we talked about his a uh, trip to China. One of the interesting things he said was, well, uh, that China was the only place where he had been considered a great man. That you can be a great professor or so forth, but, and that that was a novel experience for him and so forth. Well, uh, as you can imagine, I Oh, then he said he would come back, come down to visit me in Philadelphia some other weekend, which he did. And, of course, by that time the family uh, realized he would be coming. It was a great event. He came down and spent a weekend. That was, let's see, I graduated in 23, so that was 1922. Were you and studying we, philosophy? No, I, at college I majored in uh, sociology. I had always uh, been interested in, in the mind, let me say, I, as a child even, and I guess that was one thing that made me uh, attracted to that article originally. I, 
I can recall thinking, now if you just learn the mind of man, you'll know everything. And uh, so he was a teacher of teachers. I don't know anyway. That's sort of reflecting back. So uh, then after that, of course, we kept up correspondence on another basis than this kind. I think, if I recall right, there was a time or two when he sort of suggested in those early days that I shouldn't keep his letters. I think he probably felt someone would think it was strange for him to be writing a little girl from the mountains of Alabama. You see, I don't know. Anyway, I kept them. And um, so afterwards I went back to college, of course, and then he came out there and gave a lecture, all of which was, which they couldn't have gotten without me, you see, <laughs> and was very uh, happy. At the end of, um, he was a terrific person. At the end of my graduation and the following fall, I, th I had no money. I came to Columbia to do graduate work. I'd always had that dream of Columbia as the mecca of all learning, which in a sense it was in the 20s, you see. And uh, so I finally got registered and I saw J.D. and I'm sure largely just to help me get money, not because he couldn't have had someone else do it better. He hired me to type uh, uh, mm, that big book, Experience. What's the title? Art is Experience. No, no, no. That came later. I got a story about that. No, this one was much earlier. I have it upstairs. The tough one, the very... Well, we can get the but, title yeah. later. And he would come over. I had a little one room in uh, somebody's apartment over there on 123rd Street, I think. And he'd come over to look over the manuscripts. Often Lucy came to visit at that time. Her son was a baby, so often he'd take Carl, who was 18, about 18 months old, for a walk and come and look over how much typing I'd done, sit and talk. Not talk much. <laughs> but I used to feel, oh gee, I got this great man here. I got to get all these ideas out and so forth. Because we hadn't really established a, a real communication. I mean, I hadn't gotten over my awe of. I think I was at his house a couple of times, but usually in the capacity of being this typist of his manuscript. I often wondered why he didn't invite me down there. I learned later it was because Mrs. Dewey was not too well. And uh, I think during all that time, J.D. never really opened up with any, you know, of himself and his feelings. I have always felt that one place that both Bino and I occupied in the family was well, I'm a very affectionate person, open in it, which the Dewey children and J.D. himself wasn't. But I think that meant something uh, to him, you see. And uh, well, Bino was? Uh, Bino was effervescent compared to the Deweys, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a feeling that's uh, one, uh, yes, one of the reasons perhaps that they were so attracted to Bino and, and adopted him. This gay little Italian boy was something in that New England family that sort of brought up on control your emotions in a sense. Well, anyway, I didn't uh, get conjoined with the family and I found out later it was because Mrs. Dewey was not too well. and uh, She died, I believe, in 27. I really shouldn't say this, but I will. But that time I was through graduate school and, no, I was in graduate school, 27, I had a fellowship and so forth. Anyway, all of a sudden, J.D. changed. He was like 25 years younger and came to all the parties. It was just 
terrific. In a way, I think that decade, uh, between about 1927 and uh, 1940, somewhere in there, were, was the period when he was most just himself. He, he established a great camaraderie with his children, and uh, then I was often at the house and at their summer place in Nova Scotia. And when I went to the medical center, Evelyn came and wrote the, uh, uh, did the research in, on the bibliography and wrote a book in connection with her. So after that, it was, it, it was just terrific. We, um, after I went to the medical center, I lived Which on a hundred medical center is this? Columbia. I was doing research work there, and of course J.D. was one of my advisors, but he was always more than that. Uh, and um, I used to have little, e every, what you call an at home, on Thursday evenings people came, Woodworth and John Dewey always there, the depression was on. It was terrific, you know, we'd just sit around and make the world over and uh, this and that. Then I, oh, earlier than that, it was 20, 28, I went to um, Tallahassee and taught for a year. And he came down there and gave a lecture while I was there. And then we went to Europe uh, in 29. He was already over there and he met me uh, at Southampton and we went up through uh, London and uh, went first to London then up to Scotland, Inverness and you know he's a terrific storyteller really when you uh, get to know him. Well at Inverness at that hotel I tell you you couldn't you couldn't buy a thing came Sunday morning and I always remember this story that J.D. told me there the um, American salesman who arrived at the hotel on a Saturday night and they asked him if he wanted a girl and he said no not tonight so maybe tomorrow so the next morning they uh, came a rap tap tap at the door and the uh, he opened the door this salesman and there was the girl who explained her purpose and so he said all right and he got up and started to shave and she was getting undressed, and he looked in the mirror, and he was shaving and whistling. So uh, as he whistled all at once, he looked, and she was getting dressed again, like fast as could be. And he said, what's the matter? She says, I will know I fornicate with a man what whistles on the Sabbath. So, <laughs> I suppose Everybody that, has their pencil. <laughs> I suppose I remember that story because J.D. told it to me at Inverness. <laughs> and uh, from Inverness, we took the boat down through the locks. And, and, over to Paris, and then he went to Carlsbad. He was taking the baths there, and I went to Vienna and uh, visited Lucy and Wolf. I think Lucy and Wolf met each other on China. that China trip, you see. Yeah. And uh, so that was way back in 29. Now we're back to the 30s again after I'd gone to the medical center. All I can say there, it was just a very uh, devoted sort of daughter-father daughter relationship. I'm sure, uh, and of course, I was closely identified with that first family and often uh, did... Well, then in 36, I had met Rudy by then, but we weren't married. And we went over on the Normandy, and Rudy and uh, his engineering friends were out in first, first class, and John Dewey and I had our, and there was somebody else. We were all out in third class, not tourists, third class. <laughs> but he was always uh, modest that way, you know. Um, well, now, with a group of engineers of the Bell system, 
to measure the vibration. And of course, they would give us very fancy quarters in first class. <laughs> John Dewey was in third class. <laughs> As befits a philosopher. What? <laughs> As befits a philosopher. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, I remember we, we tried to in <coughs> invite him over uh, to first class and have dinner, lunch with us. and. Uh, he felt very uncomfortable. He says, I'm a third class passenger. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was genuinely modest. Not. Uh, but I remember how, how the, the students were after him. He was always surrounded by a lot of students. And this was in summertime. But then he came and went on a trip with Rudy and uh, some of Rudy's relatives, and Lucy was with him. We went to Hallstatt, you remember? Oh, yeah. And over the uh, simmering, that was about a, a week trip. And uh, what's that? What other things? The rest of it is. Well, he uh, he also he also married us. In the oh sense. yes, we were married at his. You see, let me go back. He he was a terrific person because I was a little bit of a rebel as a child, always. Although I went to these Methodist schools, my own family were not religious, but, uh, and, and uh, while I was at that school, these, this missionary, home missionary man came, and uh, he, I won't go into all that, but in any event, he was instrumental in my getting to Ohio Wesleyan, and he and his wife loaned me money, and I got all involved in that religious business then. So when I came, first came to Columbia, this man sat down, sort of steered me into uh, religious education at Teachers College. I'm sure J.D. knew it wasn't right for me, but he never said it. And it wasn't that they pushed me, it was just you want to do something to please the persons who... So finally, I'm sure they want me to be a foreign missionary, you see. Yes. And I guess I just couldn't go through with it. Uh, these board, missionary boards would uh, call me and they gave me assignments and I'd think of reasons each time. I said, oh, i got to pay back my college debt. Oh, we'll pay that. I said, no, I went through college on my own. I'm so I got off to, I, so I decided to go to Puerto Rico and work in a government school and said to them, then I'll learn how I get along working in a foreign country. So I wasn't down there three months till I got the courage to write back and say, this is not for me, you see. So I came back and at the end of that year and uh, entered Columbia in psychology. Then J.D. would tell me, that uh, right he, he, yeah, that he felt I'd made the right decision. But as long you as you, you said? but as long as you you're in it, he'd never let you know that. Then uh, another thing at Nova Scotia, I never got over being amazed at him. We used to go up there, and they'd have these people, all of us sitting around talking loud, my drinking and uh, jokes. He could sit there on that porch and type on his logic and never know we were there, in a sense, you know. He, but as soon as he put it down and joined us, he was just, then that was gone. He was part of the party. So I never knew how he was socially, really, until that period after Mrs. Dewey's, uh, his wife's, first wife's death. I think something that was inside that neither his New England upbringing and so forth allowed to come out, came out then, all this story, t joking and uh, telling stories, even little risque ones and so forth. In the early letters, when I was a child, he wrote me very often about the family. I remember one letter were at great length was when Fred went in the army, the First World War. When we were together, we often discussed his children. I would ask him, did you do so and so in the bringing them up? I remember once I said, did you ever make your 
uh, uh, prevent your children going to Sunday school? And he said, well, yes, I guess so. He said, I remember they came around uh, wanting them to go to Sunday school. You know how these people do. And Mrs. Dewey just said to him, I served enough time in the church for me, my children, and my grandchildren. <laughs> and, oh, then the uh, corrections he gave me on a lot of the stories that have crept around about them, many of which are utterly unfounded. Um, others, such as the one where they wrote so much about his freedom and having the children call him by his first name. You remember? Yes. Uh, Get the Mop, John? Yes. That was on Fred. He said, well, there was a basis of fact, but it wasn't the tub and the uh, toys floating around. It was a faucet without a sink under it. And that the only reason Ted, uh, Fred called him John was because he was the first child, and you hear each other being called John. And uh, that happens in many families. But a lot of people pick that up, whether it's right to let the child. You've heard yes. that sort of talk, too. And then, well, let's see. A few times we went to Florida. Well, once I remember he and Larry Frank and I were down there at the same time. Oh, and when he was in Russia, this is a music. When he was in Russia with uh, Evelyn and Liz and so forth, I lived in his house on 62nd Street and took care of his mail. And like anyone of note, he got some mail that even anybody could tell was a crank, you know. So I said to him one day, gee, as I read your mail, I'm amazed you ever wrote to me that you didn't think this was a crank, a little teenager down in Alabama. He said, well, I'm not, I guess I'm not much of a psychologist, but I think I'm enough of a psychologist to tell a crank from one who isn't. <laughs> he was absolutely. So, uh, When Rudy and I got married, I didn't feel that I wanted any church wedding, but I did feel I wanted something of a wedding, more than just running to the uh, city hall and so forth. So I found something in that there was this old law in New York, only two, only one other person, had, a uh, couple had been married by it, and that turned out to be Larry Frank and his first wife, whom I knew, but I didn't know, that you can be married in New York Did by you contract. Know that, I knew it only at my wedding. Larry was there, and he told me. Oh. So, um, so I wrote out this ceremony, and we were married at J.D.'s apartment. And, uh, we were married first, then. First down there, but I mean the ceremonial marriage was there, and he made a little talk, and that was it. And uh, you remember what he said? That you see, I was funny there. I, I didn't want any movies or and recording. We didn't do so much then. Well, we did make a movie. Yeah, but that was a year, two years later. I didn't let you make. It was a joke. We didn't. That was two years. Mitzi was born then. Don't you remember? Uh, so, <laughs> I, I didn't want the wedding all tied up with machinery and so forth, and he never made a copy of it, so I never had a copy of what that uh, was, I don't think. A copy of what? Of his remarks at our wedding. You remember he talked. I don't, I can't remember what the essence of what it, what he was saying, but I suppose it had something to do with marriage being a contract in any event. And uh, meantime, you see, Liz used to travel with him, too, a lot. Let's hope. I think we're ready to continue now. Okay. Well, we, 
frequently lunch together with J.D. coming up to the medical center or my going down to Columbia and uh, eating at the faculty club. And as I said, he was... Uh, then after the, uh, that following the wedding, but the wedding had to be scheduled on a particular day because Liz Dewey, he was living with Liz and Fred at that time in an apartment. Uh, at one time he lived with Evelyn on 62nd Street and then with uh, Liz and Fred. I forget which one was when he first got that Fifth Avenue apartment. He told me he was almost ashamed to walk in it. He he was a modest man that way, you see. So... Um, you think he was too pretentious? Yes, he thought he was too pretentious. And um, so... Uh, the oldest son of Fred and Liz had been killed in an automobile accident, so they decided to have another child, and that child was just about due. In fact, Liz couldn't be at the wedding because she'd gone to the hospital to born Joanna. And uh, after that, Liz was pretty occupied with a baby, you see. And J.D. and I were frequently together, but not as much once I got married. That were, You're just not available then as much to go places and so forth, you see. Whereas before, if he wanted to go down to Florida and he needed someone, I could arrange my vacation and go along, or Liz could arrange hers and go some. But that tied both of us up about the same time. And then came my baby, and I was, and we moved out here. And that's how that Robbie got drawn in. And in the beginning, both Liz and I, we were all delighted that J.D. had someone who could go with him, you see, because a uh, man his age. But then it didn't. How old was it? Uh, well, let's see. I was. We He's 40 70. years older. What? He must have been in his 70s, wouldn't he? Oh, yes. Oh, I remember when he told me he was retiring from Columbia. This was in my bachelor days there on 119th Street. I said, what for? He said, well, I'm 70. We just couldn't believe it. He was younger than he was when I went there in 23, you see, in spirit and all. And he said, well, Butler hangs on all the time, so I think the rest of us had better get out and uh, <laughs> set the pattern. Another thing, he, when I was 17, that's when he sent this book to me. Child, uh, teenage like I wrote him, I'm 17. Da, da, da. And he wrote back and said, uh, the last digit of his age was also seven. The difference was that there was a five in front of it instead of a one. They said the most peculiar thing is you don't feel any different with the five instead of the one. He said, of course, you behave differently, otherwise you'd be silly. But you don't feel different. And you know, I thought of his saying that to me, or writing that to me years ago, because I've noticed it so much as I have grown older, now 67, that you really don't feel different from before. So, um, well, anyway, uh, another time, he was sitting in my office. I don't remember whether this was after my marriage or not, or some, but whatever brought it up. He said, you know, we've never had a quarrel. And I wondered whatever under the sun made him say. It never dawned on me you'd ever quarrel with John Dewey about anything. And uh, then I went to California in the summer, and I, his letter, he was in Nova Scotia, and his letters didn't come. I couldn't understand it and so forth. And when I got back, I discovered that somehow Liz and I had offended Robbie. And that began a kind of uh, cleavage. But meantime, I'd moved out here and the war was on and life was different from me. But it just, that was a very peculiar thing. And I'd, 
I didn't understand it, really, until... Uh, How uh, long had he been married then? Oh, he wasn't married. Oh, I see. Not then. When he, the only way, when he married, Liz called me up horrified and said that he and Robbie had decided to get married and uh, for God's sakes I should stay away. It seems that there were these two children, these Belgian children, and she had persuaded him to, by that time he was really getting a little, I, I don't like to say the word senile because it wasn't he was not intellectually senile at his 90th birthday. I mean, he could talk those things, but his behavior certainly changed. I thought maybe it changed toward me. I didn't know until I got with Evelyn and the girls, and I found out it was toward all of them. And uh, it, it was just too sad. And that I sat with the family at the 90th birthday dinner, and to us who had known him, this kind of display that went on was so out of keeping with the man that we'd known. For example, we kept wondering. They didn't, he didn't appear and didn't appear. Mm -hmm. And 98 years, we all wondered, my goodness, has this little bit of excitement. So, well, after a while, they come making this big stage entrance. And there were all these children. Years. He was 90. Oh, 90. And, 90. and a whole lot of little children. I said to Evelyn, who in the devil are those children? She said, I wish I knew. I don't know. It would, but all that sort of display that came into his life under this. Uh, by that time, she was married to him, of course. She must have married him when he was about 86 or 7 or something. And... Um, it, it was a little sad for us, but at the same time, as Liz said to me on the phone, well, we had him at his best, and I think we did. One other thing I remember so often, just a few little things he said once. I never heard him defend himself but once, in any way. And uh, his, his writings, as you know, are not easy reading. And I... When I went to, um, well, one time I got a little fed up, as, as one can, and I was in my office at the medical center on a Sunday and noticed an ad for these tours to Bermuda. So I just called up and made a reservation and to leave on Tuesday. And J.D. had just given me a copy of his art as experience. So I didn't feel like socializing. I sat on deck and read this. And, and it was just terrific and so forth. And so when I got back, I said, gee, you know, you're beginning to write the way we can. I can understand you. You're writing so much better. And for the first time, he said, well, one reason it's um, difficult to understand, I guess, is I see things other people don't see. And I didn't quite realize the impact of that until, uh, well, earlier. I had written um, this book on growth, and I'd quoted Coghill a few times, and it, a few times, but in the first chapters I'd. So on an occasion, uh, I had some thought, I don't know about reflexes or this or that, which I thought was a new idea, and I was discussing it with J.D., and one time he said, yes, that's a new language. But when I went back to read the first chapter to check, I saw Coghill had said that same thing, but I'd never seen he said it. And that's what J.D. was meaning, you see. So, um, let me see if there are... Did you ever things. hear him react to uh, criticism? Well, he did. It, it didn't touch. Uh, and that, that's the only time I ever heard him defend so. himself in any way, which was, and and he he was not inhibited in what he would say to me. Um, I think he felt too much that other people had a right to their opinion. 
whether it was critical of him or not or whatnot. And I think in some ways he was impervious to it. He was so wrapped up in his own thinking, you see, that uh, I took a few courses with him in my early graduate days and also with Kilpatrick. It was a terrific thing. You move from one to the other, the difference in their style. Of, uh, Wasn't Sidney Hook with him then too? Yes, um, but later I think, not in the early 20s, it was in the early 20s, 23, that I was taking courses with him. And of course there were any number of uh, important people I met through him and at his house and that sort of thing. And I forget who it was said to me once uh, that the girls just took it for granted that you had exciting and interesting people around. They didn't realize how much J.D. and Mrs. Dewey worked to have that kind of family environment and that kind of uh, nourishment, so to speak, for their own intellectual life. Um, I think he felt that Jane was more like him temperamentally uh, or in her intellectual processes than the others. I'm sure he felt that Fred was the business fellow and least like the others, um, and that Lucy was the more just, that her reactions to things would be more like the ordinary one, you know. But he and Evelyn were closer in a way, well, partly because she was there and available, and they worked on books and so forth. And Bino, I remember uh, I was amused that Mrs. Dewey took Bino back as a young fellow back to Italy to learn Italian. And uh, J.D. told me that after they brought Bino over here, he wouldn't talk. They couldn't get anything out of him, any kind of language. And then all at once, he spoke in English. And he said, I didn't come over here to be an Italian. And <laughs> so he pushed it aside. He wouldn't talk anything till he learned enough uh, but much of our conversation was about the family and so forth. Did you ever question him about disciplining the children? Yes. He didn't. Did anybody? Did uh... <laughs> uh, I don't. Uh, I remember the story of Evelyn telling me this. How dreadful it was for the rest of them. They were the whole family was supposed to go someplace. Jane was little. And Jane wouldn't pack her bag, and they missed two trains or something, waiting for Jane <laughs> <laughs> to make up her mind <laughs> to pack up her bag and go. I'm sure Evelyn felt that Jane was highly sport as a child, and when Evelyn told me this, she said, but I think spoiling is probably pretty good for children. I don't know. I wonder whether you um, heard him on the Normandy when these students kept pestering him, asking him very pointed questions uh, about education. How do you research education? How do you, they, they raise the same questions that are being raised now. How do you teach reading? How do you teach comprehension and understanding? They fired all these questions uh, at him. I guess I was so accustomed to him then that I didn't, uh, that didn't register with me. I don't remember it. And, um, and this, this was highly interesting to them. As this was 19, uh, when, when was it, 1936? that we went on the Normandy. <clears throat> well, we didn't have the new math and we didn't have <laughs> the new reading techniques, but he was uh, quite level-headed and um, and then say the, the methods we are using now are pretty old-fashioned and, and need very much correction. In other words, he foresaw these things that 
we know now are so important. Oh, well, he was just way ahead of... Sometimes I wish he were here. We so need a John Dewey for this computerized and automated age. We're so in need of a frame of reference, a philosophy to go by, at what he did for the industrial period of development and the role of the individual in that and and the role of the individual in s society now has changed and uh, it's it's just too bad we don't find someone who can do for this era what he did for that era but maybe he's still the best if we could reinterpret it I don't know I was wondering if his influence if you feel that his influence will come into the ascendancy again. Oh, I think so. Uh, because he... he uh, oh, I'll tell you another th remark he made. Uh, you see, his philosophy was based on growth. And growth is the basis of life. Well, after I got back from uh, that little trip to Bermuda when I spent my time reading his uh, artist's experience, which I still hold dear to me. It somehow clicked more than the other books, even the one I'd typed, which was a difficult one. Uh, I was telling him how excited I got. I said, I even, I could see my babies growing. And, and, and he said, well, that's one of the finest compliments I've ever had. In other words, I, I didn't, well, I'd gotten something myself, mm -hmm. which I brought to reading him, but they were united, you see, and uh, and that he saw, that this, there had been really a, a transaction. So I think in time now, with as much interest in, in growth and breaking away from uh, traditional stimulus response psychology, and the rigidity of principles based on rats running mazes and this and that, it'll come. He'll, he'll come back again. In uh, your special interest in your field, did you ever have any discussions with him about Freud? Well, not too much, because I wasn't interested in Freud myself. Um, I think, I don't know, I really don't know what J.D. thought about Freud. Did he ever give any indications to you that he thought he should rework psychology and write another book? Uh, in, in psychology? Yes. No. Mm -mm. No, I think J.D. felt philosophy was was his field and uh now he you was very much interested in art you remember when you oh went yes to this barnes museum mm -hmm. um, you know barnes uh you know barnes and his i know about collection. harry um, yeah. yeah he was a great friend of his as a matter yeah. wasn't it all the barnes that sort of made up for his salary when he resigned from Columbia? J.D.'s what? Uh, the salary that he uh, should have gotten from Columbia. Gee, I never heard anything about that. That's true. Yeah. What? Yes, he did. You but mean uh, J.D. didn't get his rightful pension? Well, I don't know whether that's true, but Barnes gave him a s certain amount of money when he retired s uh, so much annually. Yeah. Well, I know to his pension, yeah. uh, 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 Barnes was certainly devoted to him. Now that was another thing. These these people that uh, uh, such a variety of people that that J D understood and had an interest in that maybe you and I might call them mavericks of a sort. Uh, Barnes certainly was th that in a way. His art, but with all of his women. Well, and phony women at that, but J. D. could take all that. I mean, it, it never let anything like that 
interfere with his judgment of what earth. And then Alexander, Matthias Alexander, and uh, mm. what was the other one? Well, I went to the other one. J.D. and I both were going to him at one time, when I met you. Mm. But I never could catch it. I don't know what it was that these Alexanders had, but I think I was always looking to try to find it, and looking I couldn't find it. I talked about psychoanalysis with Evelyn, because she went through a little bit with somebody, I forget who it was, some woman friend. And I never had too much faith in it, you see. Less faith in it now, in a way. I mean, I think the whole, di many of the ideas have made us a sick society, it made us so concerned with ourselves that we can't live. And uh, so Evelyn said, oh, I, I remember saying to Evelyn, I can't see it. I see these people go spend all their money to a psychiatrist. All right, you're a little withered up old maid and you don't like being a little withered up old maid. Uh, so they go to the psychiatrist or uh, have a psychoanalysis. As far as I can tell, they're still little withered up old maids. And Evelyn said, well, but you can't tell if they feel better inside. I guess I was too much the behaviorist in a sense. He did talk to me a good deal, of course, about John Watson. And John Watson was on my advisory council there, too. So often we, all of us, met. And John Watson, a few times, came to these little meetings I had on 119th Street. And uh, they got along all right. It was fine. But I remember J.D. said to me that when he first, when this whole conditioning thing came out, uh, it was so appealing. It was appealing because it was so simple and that you could be misled by it. And, uh, of course, it's static. This stimulus, that response, and uh, so forth. Whereas he saw everything as an ongoing process. You can't... Uh, so... Uh, Was Dewey himself ever under psychoanalysis? No, not the, to my knowledge. I don't think so. The only things he did that were a little esoteric or what not necessarily was Matthias Alexander and Matthias's brother. And he did apparently feel that those baths and things at Carlsbad uh, helped him. But I don't know of anything that would be a little on the... Maybe the girls knew of something, but I think I would have known it if it had happened in the... Or something like that could have happened uh, after Robbie came in. And uh, so I don't know. Uh, well, anyway, I found out that I went... He was in the hospital once after well, he knew Robbie, but before they were married. So this was in the Pittsburgh? No, here in New York. And I went in to see him. This was the first real kind of misunderstood uh, hurt that I had about it. And first of all, I had to wait a long time, but this was a urinal of urogenital of some sort, and he was just a, an impossibly sensitive person on Personal things of thing. that sort. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't let me go in. I stood at the door and talked to him. So later I told Evelyn about that. She said he did it to all of them. He, something happened funny between him and the first family after this Robbie, and I belonged to the first family you see, uh, in identification. Uh, I don't know what it was. I, I never have figured out how it happened that uh, she got that kind of control over him. Because it didn't happen over his intellect. It was only in these interpersonal Personal things. Personal relationships. And uh, the fantastic. 
I don't hear much about her now, do you? What happened to the to that foundation they set up? It's uh, still... Dormant? Well, she's apparently trying to organize a board for it. Oh, you mean they're not giving away any of the money or anything? Mm. Well, it, it's sad because it was so out of keeping with the with the Dewey of so many years. I think most everybody understood and saw through it, huh? Uh, at least they... She sees herself as the protector of John Dewey. All these Did things... Did you talk to him? She wouldn't talk to him. Well, I, you, you remember, she invited me once. Oh, I know you. I, I We've forget got my connection with what, what it was. And uh, at that time, she appeared to be a rather a, a nice person. I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, see that there was anything wrong with her. <coughs> well, but for him to have someone to take care of, uh, you know, when you get older and that you have absolutely nobody but your own children, must well, be Well, that's the way he is, and I felt in the beginning that just that he had someone around to to go with him and so forth. But after, well, for example, the stuff she put in the paper when they married, uh, the, the interviews that. He'd settled everything with his first children, and do 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 do. Oh, I mean, that it, to those of us who knew him, that was just uh, terrible. <laughs> I'm telling you, one funny thing. When one year I was at, uh, back, I lived on 54th Street then. And he was on 52nd, and. Uh, we met for lunch at various places, but I remember one time I I met him and I had to go someplace afterwards, and I calculated I would go in the subway with him. I didn't have any any uh, money. We had lunch. I didn't have any money, and then during lunch he let me know he was going in another direction, so he wouldn't be paying my subway. You see. So I took a dime off the tip yep. he left <laughs> and <laughs> for my subway. And oh, it must have been years later that I, after I was working, and so I told him about that. I thought it was a huge joke. And you know, he was hurt even after those years <laughs> that I hadn't had the guts to say to him, I don't have a dime to pay my subway. <laughs> Of course, if the dime had meant less, I suppose I would have. <laughs> oh, no, but he was a great guy. And uh, I don't know, what's the boy that they... That was another thing that just blew Ted, uh, Fred and Liz for a loop. They turned around and named that boy John Dewey. And it was John Dewey Jr. that was killed. Well, you know he would never have done a thing like that on his own. I mean, if he hadn't been seen now. Well, Fred was the first one to tell me his father was seen now. I guess that was about uh, shortly after the 90th birthday dinner. But he just did things that didn't seem in keeping with the personality we'd known in that personal human relations way. As a thinker, no, he was not at that point. No, no, he still, that, that lecture he gave at his 90th birthday, I didn't see him after that. Do we still have his record? Mm-hmm. Who was you? You mean the one on art that she gave us? Yeah. I have it upstairs with Mitzi's things. Have you? Yes. Oh. I have, I have all these letters, but they're not. I'm saving them until I retire. Oh, here's the record. Shall um, we turn the tape off? Yes, I think so.
so one day i'll get